You know, yesterday or on Friday, I was sitting down, and we're having breakfast with our kids, and I had asked them about the 4th of July, and what is the 4th of July, you know? What is this holiday? And, you know, you can imagine with my children being the ages 2 to 10, I had some varied answers uh, in the 4th of July. Mixed in there were things about, you know, declaring your independence from Great Britain, so one of my children knew that one. Another one said, isn't it just about fireworks, you know, or someone else said it's about pies, and that's true. Those are part of Fourth of July, but um, just in case you may be like my children and have forgotten what we actually just celebrated this weekend, I want to bring it back to us from a statement that was put in the Declaration of Independence back, and it was signed and ratified July 4th, 1776. I think that's 244 years ago. This is the statement I want to read for us. <clears throat> we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, here's what I want to say. <clears throat> the Declaration of Independence is a declaration. Just like we may declare that I want to declare that there is going to be life, or I declare joy in this house, or I, I, I declare that I'm going to get that job, right? There is a process to any declaration. Our nation, 244 years later, is in the process of this becoming reality for everybody. Male and female, no matter what color your skin is, no matter how old you are, where you've come from, or how much money or little money you have, or what town you're from, or where you were born, or where you immigrated from, this statement is the desire, and yet we are not there. We are on the journey. We are on the journey. I think we all are, if we're honest with ourselves, we know we're on a journey, but it doesn't change the fact that that is who we want to become. And if you don't know who you want to become, then you don't really know how to get there. So we're at a crucial point in our nation on this 4th of July weekend, 2020. Who would have thought at this crucial point to say, are we going to go back and say, hold on a second, endowed by our creator. Our God is the one who said that we are valuable. Our God is the one that said that we are worth something. Our God is the one who made us with whatever color skin we have or hair we have. If you wish your hair was straight and it's curly, you wish it was straight and you curly, or if it was short or long or brown or blonde or black, or if you wish you had bigger feet or smaller feet. That's endowed by your creator. I can't help you out there. That's just how God made us. But how God made every single person is beautiful. It is by God, right? And so I want us to come back to the reality that the, that the reason why we celebrate this weekend is not because of everything that America's done right or perfect. It's because we founded a nation that was built upon this premise, which, by the way, is a biblical premise, that God says you are valuable, you are loved, you are known, there's a place for you, and that there needs to be freedoms for you and opportunities for you to live in a land free and not restricted. So we're on the journey. So I celebrate this weekend as saying we're on the journey, but it doesn't change where we're going. Now, in light of 4th of July and even this summer, we chose to do a series called We the Church. And really, it's a series on biblical values for the church. So if you're kind of wondering, what is it that, 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 that Antioch believes about what church should be like or what should be the kind of like house rules in the church family? Or what are the real values? Like, what do we really care about? This summer series, we're trekking through those one by one. If you've missed it, we talked about how we love God by living and walking by the Spirit. We talked about it on the day of Pentecost. We talked about we love God by committing to the truth of God's Word. Chris did a great job expressing just the authority of the Scripture and what is the Word of God, and we need it in our house. Not only that, but that we are persevering in prayer. prayer. Connor preached on prayer and the need for it. And not just you should pray, but to have the value and the belief system and understanding behind prayer. Um, we talked about how family needs to be our first priority in terms of our human relationships. And that really on Father's Day, that many, many issues we experience today in our nation is due to the lack of fathers being fathers. Fathers by title, but not fathers by action and words. And then lastly, Ashley shared 
about just this lifestyle of holiness and purity and that our thoughts matter and that how we approach things and how we view things, we need to be a people that are committed to being on track with the holiness of God in our lives. And today we're going to talk about honor. We're going to talk about honor, kind of fitting for this weekend. But I want to take a little different angle on it because we want to be a community that actually honors God and honors people. We want to honor God and honor people, all right? So we're going to break that down this morning. And, you know, whenever you think about a culture, so you can take your own family, for instance, or kind of whenever you get together with, like, that family reunion, you know, and you're kind of like, oh, this is like our culture and our family. And you, you may have the East Texas and the West Texas and then the Dallas and the Houston folks, and they're all gathering. And there's a little bit of, like, a little rub there, right? I mean, some people dress a little differently, they care about different things, but they're still family, but you kind of put them in this melting pot, right? And so you kind of pull together, but then you kind of see, hey, here's kind of the culture that exists in this family. Well, whenever you think about a culture, you think about what is it, like maybe you think about the five senses, right? Like what do you taste, touch, smell? What about your sight, your hearing? Like you take the five senses and say, if you pull back and look at any culture and say, hey, here's what this tastes like, here's what this smells like, here's what this looks like, then you're kind of putting together what is the culture that's established. But for us, we cannot become a culture of honor, a community that honors one another, honors God, unless we actually assess and realize where we are right now, right? So let's take a look at where we are right now, and, um, and I think it's going to help paint the picture for us. Um, now, just as I do this, I'm going to make a couple of statements that may make a few of us squirm a little bit. You know, it made me squirm when I wrote them down, okay? But squirming is okay. That's not unbiblical. Jesus made a lot of people squirm. So if you don't believe me, just read the Gospels. There's a lot of squirming going on, okay? So I'm, I'm not even close to Jesus. I'm just trying to pick up from his leadership style. Um, when I asked the question to myself this last week, I said, God, where are we right now? Like, where are we as a nation? Where are we as a church? I wrote some of these statements down. This is not all-encompassing, but this is a slice of where we are. We live in a time where slander, gossip, harsh words, criticism, lashing out, bitterness, cursing, rudeness is borderline acceptable in society. It's every day in the media. It's constant in sports. It's present in the workplace. And yes, it even exists in the church, even this church. Have you noticed that whether it has to do with the coronavirus or racial injustices, politics, sports, your office trying to reopen, or just individuals navigating life these days, there seems to be a much greater increase of blame, accusation, judgment, and criticism. I would sum it up this way. There's a great deal of finger pointing going on at history, at the government, at leaders, at neighbors, at the church. And yet, I don't think we have to stay where we are, but I think we need to acknowledge that there's a lot of this going on. I've shared this before. I think when I was in middle school, someone said, hey, be careful who you point at because you know there's always four fingers coming back at you, right? So it's okay to point at someone as long as you've already pointed out the four things in you first, right? It kind of goes back to the, hey, why are you so fixated on the speck in their eye but missing the plank in yours? Jesus said that, by the way. So, like, we need to be a people that actually say, hold on a second. Every time I want to do this, before I do this, I need to do this. Now, just to lighten it up a little bit this morning, it is on the heels of Fourth July week. And I want to show you a little video clip here. Um, this last week, I was, I was uh, at home for, you know, with my kids, and we got the Disney Plus thing, and so they decided to flip on Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. It's an old school. I haven't seen that since I was 10, I think, and so it's been a long time. Um, many of you have no idea what I'm talking about. It's such a goofy title, isn't it? Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. But um, there's a scene, I literally just caught 10 minutes, okay? There's a scene in this movie where one of the boys who lives next door, his name is Ron or Ronnie, um, he's outside hitting the baseball, and he accidentally hits it through the neighbor's house attic window, right? Now, I just want to take us into the scene. It's about two and a half, three minutes long. 
But I want you to look at and intentionally listen to and watch little Ronnie's response. All right? Here we go. Ron Thompson at the plate, bottom of the ninth. It's a clutch situation. Here comes the pitch. Oh, he's swinging like a rusty gate. He pumps once, pumps twice. Oh, he's never been good on the high outside pitch. Here he comes. Fastball is bread and butter. Grin! Slam. I didn't do it. Come on, hey, nobody has to know. Nobody saw it but you. Let's negotiate this. You and your brother, Russ. You're supposed to think on your own brother. Turn me in. I'll tell him what you spend your allowance on. Come on, Russ. Look, did you tell him? All right, tell him, okay? Okay. You tell him. Tell him. What's going on? Hi. Um, I I'm Russ Thompson from next door. Uh, um, oh, uh, my brother has something to tell you. Or else I could tell her. Okay. See, I was playing with my ball, right? Well, well actually, it's not my ball exactly. It's Charlie Suds and it is. Just tell her what you did. It never would have happened if their house wasn't so close. He had a baseball through your attic window. He what? It shouldn't have been closed in the first place. It's a nice day. We'll get it fixed, OK? We'll take it out of his allowance, all right? My allowance? Dream on. OK, we'll just have Dad pay for it, huh? We'll take it out of my allowance. Give me my ball back. Until you pay, no man shall pass. You got nothing to say about it, space boy. Cool it. Nick, take him upstairs and get him his ball and clean up the mess. What? Do it, Nick. I don't have time to mess around. Come on. All right. I know what you're thinking. Wow, Ronnie. Now, let me just back up a little bit and kind of dissect that scene for you in case it just went right here. If you notice, Ronnie said these statements. I didn't do it. Nobody saw it. Nobody has to know but you. Let's negotiate. I'm your brother. That's called hiding sin. He says either you tell them or I tell them. Okay, you tell them, not wanting to confess. Well, you see, I was playing with my ball. Well, it actually wasn't my ball. It was this other kid's ball. Not taking responsibility, right? It never would have happened if their house wasn't so close, right? Blaming the surroundings. The window shouldn't have been closed in the first place. It's a nice day. Blaming others. We will pay, he says, uh, his older brother says, hey, we'll pay to get it fixed. We'll take it out of his allowance. My allowance, dream on. No consequences for actions. Now, why did I show you this funny clip? Not because I want you to go watch it this afternoon. It's not that great of a movie. Here's why I want you to know this, though. Let's remember, in this scene, little Ronnie was not trying to hit a baseball through the attic window. But he did. That's what we call an accident. A mistake. So Ronnie made a mistake. But he still did it. How many times do we not want to take responsibility for our actions, whether we were intentional or not? Really think about this, guys. We're talking about our nation right now. How many people, how many times um, have, have you done something, but then when someone calls you out on it, you say, well, I didn't mean to. Like, that removes the thing you did. I mean, let's think about it. All right, let's use a classic example. Maybe growing up your family, somebody threw a ball at someone by accident. And it hit them, and it hurt them, right? And so then you call the children together. Hey, what happened? Well, the ball hit them. How'd that happen? Well, I was just throwing it. He was in the way. Well, didn't you throw the ball? Well, yeah, but he shouldn't have been standing there. But I didn't mean to hit him. Of course I didn't mean to hit him. You see, we somehow got confused somewhere in society that if we didn't mean to, then we are not held accountable for it. Right? 
Hopefully this sounds familiar. And I think I'm pretty aware that most of us have experienced a Ron moment with somebody. You can all think of that guy or girl who was the Ron. But I think we've also been Ron. Have we? We've also been Ron. We've literally made so many excuses for our action or inaction on something. And we have not learned as a society to take responsibility. Let's just bring it to the church. To take responsibility for what we do or how we hurt somebody or how we do something. Because we say, well, it wasn't in my heart to do that. Like that, like that just erases everything. Right? It wasn't in my heart to murder. It just happened. That's what we're getting to, just so you know. That's about where we are right now in our nation. I, I didn't mean to steal that. It just kind of was a, like an impulse. Oh, like I didn't mean to say those rude things to her. It's just had a bad day. It's not my fault. She was just the next person in line. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. It's just, right? I mean, the over and over lack of responsibility, lack of integrity. Listen, that's going to happen in society because when you live in a society where people are going to believe whatever they want to believe, but they don't adhere to anything that is absolute truth, they're going to go wayward. So remember, we're not actually asking all society to be Christians, just so you know. We're not mandating they actually all follow the Bible. But if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ, you signed up to follow this. Not your neighbor, you. Right? Brothers and sisters in Christ, you can hold each other accountable to this. Not just opinions of the day. Is it here? we got to do this, y'all. This is where God's inviting us into. I'm telling you, this, this Ron thing, as funny as it is, I was like, wow. And that, I think the movie was made in like the late 80s or something. I mean, we still have that same thing going on right now across our country. It's in America. It's in politics. It's in the racial conversation. It's in owners versus players in sports. It's in the coronavirus stuff. It's in the family right now. But beyond all of that, my largest concern is that it's in the church. That's the biggest concern. Is it for the church, for the people of God, to not be the ones taking responsibility? And I'm, just, I'm talking about just in our home. That's where we start. If, if we can't work it out at home, if we can't work it out amongst each other, and we can't take ownership, responsibility, confess, apologize, make it right, Did you see how at the very end, after all the excuses, right, he literally, the little boy who did nothing wrong has to go clean it up and get the baseball, and little Ronnie goes, right, he just, he's like, gotcha. There is no change of heart. It's like, oh my gosh, how many times do we just give lip service with no change of heart? When this exists, guys, it brings a great deal of dishonor to whatever group you're in 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 our nation. And it's sad because there's a lot of dishonor in a time we're supposed to be celebrating on a weekend like this, the founding of our nation. Again, not celebrating that everything's been done perfectly, but celebrating that we're a country that exists. So what do we do? So how do we kind (laughs) of correct course, so to speak, right, on trying to create a community of honor? Well, I want to take us way back to when God first initiated with a group of people, and he said, hey, I'm going to give you guys 10 things to really do. Here's my top 10 list called the Ten Commandments of how you guys are supposed to function as a society and as a people. Here's the 10. This is what I need you to hold true, to memorize, to write it down, to get in your system, in your culture, to where wherever this group goes, everybody knows you all for the Ten Commandment crew. Like, no, no, we do the Ten Commandments. Now, I want to just talk about honoring God for just a moment because I do not believe we can actually honor one another until we start giving him the honor he deserves. I just don't think the problem will get fixed if we just go horizontal. That's part of the problem. But the larger problem is until we surrender here and get his heart for so many things, then all of a sudden, oh, When I love God, fear God, trust God, respect God as my authority, as my father, and I come in alignment there, then whatever he says goes. So then I'm able to work it through with all the imperfect relationships when I have a perfect one here. When the perfect one is dealt with, remember, there's only, there's one perfect and one imperfect party in this one, right? It's him and me, right? 
But then here you got two imperfect parties that are supposed to work it out. But if you don't have him as the one guiding you, this is going to get really, really messy. So let's talk about the first three commandments just real briefly. You ready? Here we go. The first commandment. I'll read it to you. It's found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Pretty simple. You shall have no other gods before me. Let's go to the second commandment. Exodus 20, verses 4 through 6. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to their third and fourth generation for those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. That's a powerful second commandment. Let me just define idol real briefly, though. It's an image or material object representing a God to which religious worship is addressed or any person or thing regarded with blind admiration, adoration, or devotion. You see, an idol can be a little wooden carved image I know all of you guys are thinking about right now. It can be that, absolutely. But I would argue our larger issue in America is not the little wooden carved image. It's actually the latter. Any person or thing that I'm giving my blind admiration, adoration, devotion for. Here's how I put it this way. Is there anything in your life that you're giving more affection to than God? Is it your social media account? <laughs> Is it your spouse? Is it your kids? Is it your job? Is it the cause you believe in? Are any of those things trumping him? Because if it is, guess what you just stepped in? Idolatry. You are literally in idolatry when you start putting anything above him. That includes your family. That includes your job. That includes your country. That includes anything. It's not you can't have those things, but they are all secondary. They have to be secondary to this one. This is primary. Secondary is every other thing. And a lot of them matter, absolutely. But this has got to be primary. And I'm concerned that at times we have allowed in, without calling a spade a spade, things that actually start taking our affections, robbing from us, and taking us down a dark path. And we'll wake up two, three years later and say, what happened? And we were deceived into thinking, well, that's not idolatry. That's just a thing I enjoy. That's just a passion. That's just a hobby. Oh, they're just a fun, you know, sports hero. They're just a cool actress or actor. That's just, you know, no big deal. But all of a sudden you realize, wait a second, I can quote more of them than I can the word. I know more about this person. I know more about God. Uh-oh. You just got caught in this place of uh, maybe I just went down the wrong road. The third commandment is this. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. The definition for vain would be empty, worthless, to no good purpose. So when you use God's name in vain, when you lash out in anger, when you use it as a curse word, or when you use it flippantly, it's not just curse, a flippant response. Both of those are going directly against this third commandment, which, by the way, Jesus did not abolish the Ten Commandments. It says he came to fulfill the law and then take it up a notch. Sometimes we, we forget that. Like, Jesus didn't say, hey, Ten Commandments, you don't, you don't need to honor God anymore. That's cool. Your, your parents, forget them. Stealing's free now. You can do it. You can just repent later. You know, killing, that's no big deal. The Ten Commandments have never gone away. They've only been highlighted and taken up to not just include the external, but the internal. So the New Testament is internal and external, which is like, uh-oh, even if I put on a good show and smile, but secretly hate your guts, you just sin. Even if you say, oh, I'll help you with your groceries. You're a little old lady, I want to help her with these groceries. You just sin. Right? It's like, Oh, wait, it's not just in the act? No, it is both. 
That's why following Jesus is actually not that easy. Because it costs your life. It makes you surrender things you don't want to give up. Change things that have been ingrained in you since a child. It is reversing the cultural trend in your family. It's going to a reunion where everyone gossips and slanders. And she says, I'm going to bless and encourage. It's going to the workplace where everyone's used to cheating and stealing and one-upping and saying, no, I'm going to serve them. I'm going to help them with their project and try to, try to destroy their project. Following Jesus ain't easy. He did the difficult work of allowing us to know him, follow him. But once you receive that forgiveness, guys, and that blood from Jesus, then it's game on. It's time to get to work. You see, when you come to Christ, that's when the real work begins. You've got to repent, <laughs> confess a lot. Not just once a year. It's like becomes a daily routine, a daily culture. And then, by the way, you have to remember, hold on a second. Jesus made a way for what? Just for me to be forgiven? Just for me to go to heaven? What did he make a way for? What was the primary objective? It was to get you in relationship with God the Father. The entire reason Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave was not to make us feel better or get us out of hell. It was to get us in relationship with God the Father. Because that's what the devil in the form of a serpent separated in the Garden of Eden. He came and divided Adam and Eve from relationship with God. So a thousand years later, Jesus steps on the scene, does the work of the cross, comes back from the grave to feast death, and it says, now I can forgive sins, because if you've got sins on you, you can't know him. And for a thousand years, the Jewish people had to make sacrifices just so they could still be accepted and be good standing with God. But it never got there fully. Jesus came and said, I am the perfect sacrifice. I will finish it. He said, it is finished. Not partially done. He didn't say, this is 1.0. This is, this is it. When he did that, guys, he died on the cross and rose from the grave so you and I could know God. Not to dishonor him. Not to disrespect him. Not to use his name in vain. And certainly not to go after some created image over him. Or some personality. Or some self-absorbed glory. He made us to worship him. But we were made to worship. And when sin comes in, it actually distorts our worship meter off from him into everything else. The devil's name, name main objective is to get you off of God. He's good with anything else. You want to worship a cow? You want to worship Michael Jordan? You want to worship a cause? You want to worship a professor, an idea, a scientific research? You want to worship a little carved image or a sport? He's like, good with that. Sounds great. Just anything but the holy God who's going to destroy me. Just worship everything that won't destroy me. But God will take care of him. But unfortunately... He still lurks around, unfortunately, but not for long. Jesus will return one day, and we need to be ready as a people. I don't know if that's tomorrow, six months, when I'm 95, maybe, I don't know. Maybe it's another 500 years. I have no idea. You tell me I don't need to know, so I'm good with that. But you already told me what I do need to know is to honor God now. You know, um, Jesus had an a interesting little interaction here with some people in Mark chapter 7. Um, I'll call it an intense exchange with a group known as the scribes and Pharisees. You know these characters. Um, these were the, the religious leaders at the time who had control and power over the systems and over the people. And um, when Jesus showed up, they saw a threat to their power and their control. You guys ever notice that anywhere? Right? I mean, you ever notice when someone shows up, and they're like, wait, wait, you're going to take away my power, my control? Uh-uh. When you start doing that, people come against you hard, don't they? When you start upending the current system, well, here's all Jesus. He was big on that. Mark 7, 5 through 8, and the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Whoa, like, what happened here? I mean, has anyone said defiled to you lately? That's like a threat. I mean, so here he goes. Jesus, I love this. Oh, here he goes. This, this is Jesus Christ. You ready? And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written. 
This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching us doctrines, the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the traditions of men. Jesus literally calls them out. This is throw down on the news channel. This is two people. Just He just throws them down. What is he saying, guys? Jesus is essentially saying, you created an image of holiness and devotion, but really you are empty and vain and prideful and controlling. What you should have done is hold fast to the commandments of God, a.k.a. Ten Commandments, instead of making up your own versions of righteousness. But isn't that what we do? In our world, we make up our own versions of righteousness, which another frame you could say is what makes us feel good. Feeling good has nothing to do with righteousness or the holiness of God. It's not in the Bible. If I feel like it's right, it must be right. It's ridiculous. That's what you believe if you don't believe in Jesus. That's what you believe if you have no absolute no authority. You just make up your own every week, whatever suits you. But if you follow Christ, you've already surrendered and said, no, it's his way. It's not his way or my way. It's his way is the only way. So Jesus, here he goes. He's talking about them kind of creating their own righteousness. So I want us to be clear, guys. Honoring God starts here and it flows out of here. It starts in your heart and it flows out of your mouth. Let's not give lip service to God. Let's not forget that he actually is the all-knowing, omnipotent, omniscient, all-powerful creator God. There's actually nothing you've hidden from him ever, by the way. You can't hide. You can't hide. I mean, let's go back to Adam and Eve. They tried to hide and they couldn't. You can't hide from him. He knows it all. You might as well come clean right now and not be like little Ronnie. Amen? We don't want to be like Ron. All right, so here we go. I've got to turn the corner here. I'm about to, about to, here we go. All right, so honor God. There you go. Bottom line. All right. Just do it. Isn't that, wasn't that Nike's thing for a while? Um, the second part of creating a community of honor is where, again, we're talking about tasting, touching, smelling, hearing, and seeing this culture. And this part is actually more difficult, right? Because we're talking about people. Now we're talking about each other. It's like, hey, Tyler, I can get there. I can honor God. He is perfect. I need a reminding of his holiness. Yes and amen. He's never done me wrong, never will. That's, I, that's safe. I can do that. He's an authority, though. Remember, a lot of us got authority issues. Why do we have authority issues? I know you know the answer, but I'm going to tell you anyways. We have authority issues, one, because of sin, and two, because of your own dad. That's pretty much it. Most people I've ever talked to in my life, all over the world, this is pretty common. Sin messes you up on one hand, and then the relationship or non-existent relationship with your earthly father. You ask anybody that struggles with authority, trusting authority, and those things, it has to do with that. When that is, when the sin is dealt with, which is a biggie, and when there's a healthy relationship with the Father, it's just very rare those people are going to struggle with trusting, respecting, and obeying the Lord. Because it just makes sense. But when the earthly representation, right, what we have in an earthly father gets all messed up, then it distorts our view of a heavenly father. And that's so sad. I wish that was not the way. If there's one thing I could fix, guys, I would push that button. There's one button I would push in world history. Make every dad a real dad. That would solve so many of our problems. But I can't do that, so here we are. The gospel is going to help us get there. Amen? All right. So, again, we've got a hard time honoring people because we're imperfect. You know, in our family, we have a hearty family mission statement. It goes like this. We love honor and serve with joy. Say it with me. We love, honor, and serve with joy. That does not need to be yours. I'm just giving you an example. We made it short because otherwise we wouldn't remember it, right? But sometimes in our house, things get a little crazy. I don't know if that ever happens in your house. It does not mine every so often, like quarterly maybe. Just kidding, a little more often than that. But so when we get hit the reset button though, I sit everybody down in the living room. All right, family meeting, family meeting, just like that. Come on, guys. Hey, we look at the fridge, that's where the statement is. What's it say? We love, honor, and serve with joy. That's right. Then we unpack what loving, honoring, and serving with joy means, and then we try to go do it. It's not perfect, but it helps us to get reset. You know what I'm saying? So therefore, in a culture, in a family, in a church, we have to have something to reset the system so that we can get there as a people. 
And again, what is that daily reset for us? It's not some phrase you're going to find on social media. It's not some tagline you're going to hear in a presidential campaign. It's not even something I'm going to say. It's just right here. Here's the daily reset. You have access to it on your phone, written form, every translation on the planet more or less. You can read it. It is available. It's, but it's about us doing the work. Right? So you can't wait once a week to get this. this. This is on you to take care of now. You know, growing up, my mom would read the Berenstein Bear books to us. Have we got any Berenstein Bears fans? Come on now. Come on. They're actually pretty good. Um, you know, you got Mama Bear and Papa Bear and Sister Bear and Brother Bear, right, and the whole crew. Um, but in the Berenstein Bears, there's one called the Golden Rule. And I remember this. And actually, recently, we read it with our kids called the Golden Rule, right? And the Golden Rule simply is, right, to do unto others, you would have them do to you. All right, that's the Golden Rule. And more or less, it's, hey, just treat people how you want to be treated. It, it makes sense. Like, we know that. Like, I don't think any of you are like, wow, the golden rule. What is I never heard that before. I think we know that, right? But it's not knowing things. It, it's actually doing them. I mean, that's just difficult. We can know lots of things. You actually know a lot more things, I, I do, than we actually do. But God's invited us in to be on the new end of life. And so I want to just highlight one of the Ten Commandments here when it comes to honor. The Fifth Commandment actually says this in uh, Exodus 20, 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Honor your father and your mother. Now, when Moses was given the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, and there was thousands and thousands of parents down at the bottom of the mountain, how many of those parents would have gotten a five-star review from their kids? How many? Probably not many. All right. We like to give reviews, don't we? We're, we only buy things because of reviews. I don't know where that started, but it's just the way it is. Listen, I, I do it too. Right? Somehow we trust some person we never met before the review of a product that we've never had. But we've all, we're all hook, line, and sinker, right? But you talk, about, you talk about reviewing your parents. Let's just review our parents. Let's review these parents. These parents, God literally, he knew, he knew about the three million people down at the bottom of the mountain. He knew about that. Okay? Fire, lightning, 40 days, Moses, tablets of stone, <laughs> Ten Commandments, crazy. He comes down. That dude must have been jacked, by the way. You ever think about, You don't think about that. Moses is not some scrawny guy. I mean, tablets of stone? Have you ever picked up stone? It's so heavy. He's one in the mountain, right? Hey, here we go, guys. All the kids are like, honor your mother and father? What? Have you seen him? She can't cook? Have you? I mean, you can imagine. If you were there, you're like, Come on. God, we're there. Come on. Mom and Dad, I've seen them on their down days. He yelled at me once. Right? I'm being a little joking. When God gave these commandments, he didn't give the precursor saying, your mom and dad must be perfect in order for you to honor them. See, honor is not about the other person being perfect. It's not about them earning something from you. You give a clear and powerful commandment to honor the parents, but it is difficult for us to honor people if we don't respect and trust them, right? See, trust is earned. Respect is earned. So what do we do? Because if you don't respect or trust your earthly parents, it's difficult to honor them. It's difficult to honor them. Whether you're watching in the stream or you're here in this room this morning, I understand that parent relations are dicey. But let's define honor for just a moment when it comes to people to place a high value upon. To place a high value upon. You know, Mother Teresa, she, um, back in the 1950s in India, she started a home called the Home for the Dying. And the home's premise was that any person who was dying or very sick disease could come to the home and they'd be treated with dignity as they died. The majority of the people came there, never left. They died there. But she took it upon herself to give people dignity. And there wasn't a big survey about, well, how many things have you done right in life? How many things have you done wrong? Who's your neighbor? Right? What color skin are you? What about your home country? There wasn't that. You're a person God made and created. We're going to give you dignity and honor. 
even in your death. And by the way, none of those people really like gave back to them in a sense. They didn't like stay around and help clean and wash up. They literally came, received dignity and love and care as best they could, and then they died. Mother Teresa got honor. She got it, guys. See, honor celebrates who somebody is without stumbling over who they are not. Honor celebrates who somebody is without stumbling over who they are not. Romans 12.10 says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Love one another with brotherly affection. (laughs) Outdo one another in showing honor. Is anyone competitive in here? I know some of you are. Uh, Okay, this, this, is, this is like a challenge. For all the competitors, it's like, ooh, outdo. The Bible says be competitive. It's in the book, okay? Outdo one another in showing honor. What if that was the game we played? Oh, I'm going to honor you, right? It's like, no, 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 hey, that, no, I'm going to go above and above. I mean, that's the game we're playing. That's the healthy competition. I'm going to outlove you. No, you're not. Yes, I am, right? I mean, just, I'm going to outserve you. Oh, you gave him one pizza, I'm giving him three, right? Just, right? But it's a way to show honor and love, right? So Romans 12, 10 says this. Listen, in late 2005, I'm going to go back in time just a little bit. We're we're about to wrap up. In late 2005, um, this young lady sitting up here, young, we were dating and seriously dating. And and so I knew I wanted to marry Ashley, right? And so I, you know, went and talked to the father, did the necessary pieces needed to do there, talked to my dad, all that. Then I started ring shopping. Now, I'm a very private person. You may not know that, but I like to keep things private. I like to keep them in the, in the small circle there. And um, so I decided to go ring shopping by myself. I didn't solicit any advice from any woman, although I probably should have, <laughs> looking back. But I was determined to learn it and figure it out, right? So if you've ever been ring shopping, okay, if you're married, you're going to get married one day, whatever, diamonds, right? Let's talk about diamonds for just a moment. They're not cheap, right? They're not cheap. Now, when you go shopping for diamonds, I'm going to educate all of our young males in the room. There's something called the four C's, right? So you have carrot, you have uh, color, you have clarity, and cut, right? So the carrot's the size of the diamond, right? The color is it's, it's kind of yellow, more kind of the white clear side. Uh, the clarity has to do with kind of the imperfections and stuff inside the diamond when you get into the microscope. And the cut is, you know, princess cut, traditional, whatever, right? Okay. So you got the four C's, right? Now, let me just take you into diamonds real quick to hopefully drive my point home. Um, All diamonds are valuable. All diamonds are valuable, no matter what they're cut, no matter their shape. And yet people have different preferences, right? Like, if, if all the ladies married in the room, if you got a diamond, like, you'd show me, and your diamond looks different than probably my wife's. That's okay. Right? Like, it's okay. Actually, actually, whenever you're invited to, have, like, an engagement party, you know, you know, everyone's hiding. Surprise! You know how it goes. And then she's like, oh, just, you know, everywhere. <laughs> and if she knew it was coming, she wouldn't got her nails done that day. So just, right? I mean, just try. She knows it. How many times at that party people are like, ew. That's, wow, that's kind of small there, Cindy. You know, or... I'm seeing some imperfections in there. Uh, why'd you go with that cut? Has that ever happened? No, because you would not have been invited to that party, right? Or you'll be escorted out of that party, right? We don't do that to diamonds on a woman's finger because we know that no matter what the diamond looks like, the diamond by itself is very valuable. And then in the eye, the beholder of the person wearing it is valuable to them too. But for some reason, we decide to judge people who are, by the way, way more valuable than any diamond. And we decide which diamonds or which people we are going to honor. That's called prejudice. That's called critical. That's called judgmental. That's called assuming. That's called a lot of things. Guys, People are way more precious than diamonds, yet diamonds are the most precious gem on planet Earth. They're the most expensive thing to be hewn out of the ground. God put them there. They're created 
and you get them out, you carve them, and a woman wears it, and she remembers that's my wedding ring, whether it's big or small or whatever the cut is. I love it. And by the way, that diamond is valuable. It has value already, even before being worn. That diamond has value before it's even in the eyes of someone that really thinks it has value. Some of us struggle with honor because we don't feel honored ourselves. Some of us struggle with honoring God because the authorities in our life have not demonstrated love and respect and protection and care and covering. But then we then blame God, and that's not right. Whatever our human realities are, as difficult as it becomes for us to follow God, he is not to blame for, our, for the people in our lives that hurt us. God is good and holy and right. Sin is to blame, absolutely. Blame sin all day long, but also sins attached to people. Right? So I'm wanting to turn the corner for us as a people and go back to the statement I made, which is, look, we don't want to stumble over who people are not. We want to celebrate who they are. We want to celebrate who they are. So how do we honor our parents? And then how do we honor our authorities? How do we honor our brothers and sisters in Christ? How do we honor our neighbors? How do we focus on the fact that simply because God made that person, they have value, deserving of me to honor them? How do we do that? Um, we got to use our words, right? Some of us don't like to talk. Maybe you're a little more introverted. That's fine. You can still place honor on people. So here's what we're going to do this morning. I want to invite the band up here as we're about to close. Um, you know, uh, when I got married, she did put the diamond ring on her finger, by the way. and said, yes, that was awesome. But soon after that, and actually in our dating, I, we had some birthday parties. I was invited to go to either Ashley's or one of the families. And um, we would sit down around the table. And at some moment during the evening, someone would chime in and say, okay, guys, it's time. I'm like, it's time for what? They're like, well, now we're going to tell the person why we love them. Now, my first experience was when Ashley and I were dating, and I was a big person on not saying I love you to her face. I said, I like you. I like you a lot, a lot, a lot. Didn't want to say the love. The love was like next level. I was not. The love came with this. That was my thing, okay? So we're at the dinner table with the whole family. And they're like, let's all tell Ashley why we love her. And I'm like, sweat is forming. <laughs> Heart, I'm like, I can't do this. I can't. What am I going to do, you know? Everybody's staring at me, you know? This is the dating phase. It's, you know, you're, you're, on, you're on an edge there. So I remember everybody goes around, and, you know, we love Ashley for this. And I think I did say, like, like. I said, man, I really like this about you, Ashley, whatever I said. <laughs> but it was so awkward for me, guys. Not just because she's my girlfriend. It was awkward. Because in my family, we just, that wasn't part of what we did. That wasn't our culture, right? I, I literally, 21 years of my life, I would never at a birthday party and said, let's take the birthday girl or boy and just honor them and tell them why we love them. That didn't happen. That started in her family, and then we brought it to mine. My family now, we gather together, we'll try to take time to do that. It spread to many of your families, our friends. Some of the days said, hey, we've been honoring one another at birthday parties the last five years because we've, you know, because we've, we heard it from you, we started doing it. And I'm telling you guys, when you sit in a room with people that are unexpected at the fact you're about to encourage and honor them, it just, it breaks down the walls, guys. You wanna know how we're gonna break down the barriers in our society and the issues? It is Jesus as a solution and it's by honoring each other. Honor cuts through all the arguments. If I can just see you as a precious gem and then honor you for who you are. You know, I wanna honor Alex Donaldson this morning. We had Alex, you gotta stand up. I'll make you stand. I know we're going long in the stream, and everybody just bear with me just for a moment. <clears throat> um, Alex, you have been a woman of integrity. Um, you've nannied our kids. You've taught my daughters ballet, and you've done it with joy. I do not, I really don't know many people in my life that actually live life without complaining. I mean, you're one of the few, and I want to honor you for not only being a woman who um, puts your hands to the plow in life, but you serve people, including my family in this church for years without asking for anything in return. Like you get what Jesus said, which is I came to serve, not to be served. And I see that in your life. We are honored by it. We are blessed by it. And I wish you just could reproduce yourself everywhere. 
because you're a woman worth following, and we love you. We're proud of you. Okay. I'm going to honor one more person. Antonio, I want you to stand up. Um, some of you guys may not know Antonio. They've been at our, his family's been at our church for a couple years here. And, um, you know, even Antonio and I haven't hung out a lot. Uh, but just recently, just been able to begin talking to Antonio and having conversations about life. And um, Antonio, I want to tell you that you are a man who, like David, uh, you, you seek after his heart. I see that in you, even just in some texting we've had and some conversations, like there's a man he wants, he wants God's heart in him and his family and people, and I see that in you. And even through the challenges of with the basketball team and having to navigate all those waters, I've seen you stay in there with joy and humility, and you press into those players, and you press into people, and you do it for next to nothing, and you do it because God's invited you in this opportunity. And I see that you're a man that's committed to a calling. When he gives you something, you hold on to it and you don't let go. I'm thankful for you. I want to honor you as a brother. And I'm proud of you, Antonio. Here's how we're going to end. Um, we're going to take a moment here. And we're going to actually pull out your phone. And I want you to text one person right now. Just pull your phone. If you don't got one, use your mom and dad's phone. All right? Pull out a phone. I want you to text one person that you need to honor this morning. It may be your mom and dad. And maybe if you've never done that, I might suggest you start there. Because the fifth commandment says, let's honor our mom and dad. Not for everything they did right, because they're your mother and your father. So I would encourage you, maybe it's texting them. Maybe it's your brother or sister and your family. Sometimes those are the hardest ones to honor. But just take a moment right now and just think, who can I honor? And just shoot them a text right now. Just give you a moment to do that. If you're at home, pull out your phone, do the same thing. Just pull out your phone and text somebody that you know you can honor who needs that right now. wrapping that up. I just want to read this scripture. Psalm 139, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. So just want to stand as you finish texting. We're just going to end here with the chorus. But I read that to you because I want to remind us who our God is. We love because God first loved us. And my prayer this morning is that we would step into that place of first and foremost honoring God. That that's where it starts. We have to get that right. And then when we get that right, we begin 
can see the people around us we need to honor and love and serve. So Jesus, we just pray this morning that you would do it in us. Let us outdo one another in showing honor. Let us hold true to honoring you, God, not having any other gods before you, nothing else that would even come close to you. Lord, I pray that if our affections have gone wayward, that you would, you would shift us, God, and get us back in alignment with you, God. We know that's what forgiveness is all about. We can be forgiven of the past. The first half of the year is the first half. It's on to the second half. The second half of 2020 can be better. It doesn't have to be the same. That we can change and our hearts can change and we can humble ourselves, repent, confess, and come clean and say, God, help me. And then, God, we can look at people as precious gems, as those that you created, no matter what their shape, no matter what their size, no matter what their color, no matter what the clarity is in that diamond, Lord, we just ask, Lord, let us be people that honor that that is who we are and that is what we do. Lord, right now, we just lift our eyes up to you. We just say, God, we need you to be God, to reveal yourself in a fresh way to us. We want to honor you with our lives. And that's where it starts. We thank you, Jesus. Amen.